to Transportation Chain, a series focused on how current events are impacting transportation, trucking, and supply chain management. My name is Becky Schultz, and I'll be your host for this episode. Today, we take a look at the labor issues in these various industry segments and how they have been impacted by the ongoing pandemic. In this episode, my colleague Sarah Jensen, editor of OEM Off Highway, and I will discuss the potential for reshoring in the manufacturing industry and how it could affect production in the U.S. and construction activity, as well as labor availability and cost. We'll also hear from Kurt Benink, Senior Field Editor of Equipment today, who will delve into the recent changes announced to the hours of service regulations in the trucking industry and what it means for both drivers and transportation service providers. But first up is Marina Mayer, Editor-in-Chief of Food Logistics and Supply and Demand Chain Executive, who will share insights on what she's seeing and hearing about driver and labor shortages in the transportation sector. Let's check in with Marina now. Hello, my name is Marina Mayer, Editor-in-Chief of Food Logistics and Supply and Demand Chain Executive. And I'm here to talk about labor shortage in the trucking industry. It's a challenge that many in the trucking industry have been facing for years. And it's a challenge that's been impacting the industry for close to two decades, if not more. With your first opening statement that the labor shortage has always been an issue in the trucking industry, I started on this job in January of 1993, so 27 years ago. And one of the first studies I worked on was a driver shortage related study. So you know, two decades plus, we've been talking about the driver shortage, and it really does ebb and flow with the uh, economy, which is is relevant to what we're seeing during COVID. Certainly, we had a, a very well discussed and documented driver shortage before the pandemic started. And even in the early phases of the pandemic, when we saw spikes in truck activity, because People were rushing out to buy toilet paper and non-perishable food items, and hospitals were having to stock up with PPE and, and medicines and everything else. Certainly, demand was high for truck activity, but as more states started to shut down businesses and manufacturing shut down, we saw a definite drop-off in truck activity. We use truck GPS data to do that research, and it's a very definite drop-off in truck activity perhaps more exaggerated or more obvious in states where there's a heavy manufacturing base like in Michigan. And so with that drop off in truck activity, obviously less demand for drivers. And so for the time being, the driver shortage is not really a top industry issue right now because fleets who still have business have the drivers they need. Uh, And where there has been some shifting, some sectors have been hit harder in the trucking industry than others as a result of the pandemic. And so even those good drivers who perhaps their fleets don't have as much business, if they're not staying with that fleet, are likely finding some work in those sectors of the industry where it is, where they still have a lot of business. According to the American Trucking Associations, the labor shortage in the trucking industry in terms of unfilled positions is roughly 60,000 drivers. That's largely due to the relatively high average age of the existing workforce. I I think the pandemic has actually alleviated the labor shortage problem in trucking for the time being. With freight volumes dropping, some carriers have reduced capacity while other smaller operators have either temporarily or permanently ceased their operations. Still, I think the demand has dropped, weakening the market further than before COVID and making the driver shortage at least temporarily a non-issue. This will definitely be uh, temporary, though, as more businesses open back up and people get back to work in the second half of the year. We'll certainly see the driver shortage as a long-term challenge for the trucking industry, and I anticipate that it will be probably first half of 2021 when we start to see that impact uh, the business and, and start to drive rates back up again. You know, the average age of drivers in the U.S. is around 55, and and getting older every day, and I don't imagine sufficient numbers of new recruits coming into the workforce. And you have to keep in mind that the issue may become even worse if the idle capacity doesn't come back. New operating protocols to keep drivers safe may be a factor as well, preventing truck utilization strategies like slip seating 
where we put multiple drivers into the same cab. And of course, some drivers just won't feel safe until we have a vaccine. Plus, the overnight influx in e-commerce, combined with a changing workforce demographic, continues to further widen that labor shortage gap. The driver shortages are very high in the trucking of for hire segment. And the driver turnover is very high. In fact, it, it hovers around 92 to 95 percent over the last three to four years. Now, the private fleets are quite different, although they're all uh, they're certainly all different in their own. But generally speaking, I would say that turnover is closer to 25 percent. And part of the reason for it is that the private corporations are public companies, but they're private fleets tend to have a little higher pay scale and a little better um, compensation package with health care and things like that. And I think their driver force is more steady. Certain industries within it, like the industrial gas industry or fuel industry, where it's hazardous cargo, and that has a tendency to have more expertise and therefore better trained drivers and their longevity is better. But we have seen since coronavirus has hit, it's no longer a driver shortage, it's really a driver surplus right now. However, some industry experts say the coronavirus has upended the driver shortage, making it almost a non-issue for many of today's fleet providers, at least for the time being. I, I think the minute the economy rebounds and freight demand goes back up, I think we'll start to hear and see in the data the, the driver shortage play out. For those fleets, for instance, if you are a tank fleet operator who hauls gasoline to gas stations, you saw a tremendous drop off, particularly in March and April, because Americans were staying at home and not driving their cars. So those fleets aren't out recruiting and looking for drivers. Fleets that service the autom automobile manufacturing industry, those fleets are not out recruiting drivers or haven't had uh, the demand for their vehicles and their equipment. It's a very temporary, and, and certainly we hope for, in terms of the economy, a very temporary situation that I believe will, as the economy rebounds, we will start to see the driver shortage come back. Uh, hopefully, we'd like to say with a, with a vengeance, that's a weird thing to ask for, but, but, right. but we want the economy to rebound and, and we want there to be that freight demand that tells us we need to go out and get new drivers. Emerging technologies also help entice the younger generation to keep trucking in mind when selecting a major within the supply chain field. The overall rapid growth of supply chain fueled most recently with e-commerce has played a large part in driving demand up. And I think some companies have just, I think, recently realized the power that logistics and supply chain have to improve uh, both their customer experience as well as create efficiencies in their business. Beyond the overall issue of competition for talent, where we're seeing highly skilled labor being attract, attracted to other sectors such as IT and startups. It's also due to the changing nature of uh, supply chain management and the new skill sets that we see in the industry. We're looking for skills in areas such as technology where there's an extreme shortage of logistics engineers, data scientists and the like. Things like change management are becoming more and more important as we start to look across a shipper's enterprise or across their supply chain network or more. And I think this just puts us in competition with a lot of other traditional industry sectors. But post-COVID-19, industry experts predict labor shortage to return, especially as stores, restaurants, and schools open back up and consumers return to their original shopping routines. In fact, the American Trucking Association estimates the truck driver shortage to increase to 175,000 unfilled positions by 2026. And Advanced Training Systems says that if there aren't enough long-haul truckers to make timely deliveries, such as groceries and medications, then in about 6 to 12 months, this labor shortage problem will become a crisis. That's why automation is key to improving the way truckers do business. In the last 10 years, there have been more advances in the equipment and how it's handled and how it's managed than there were in the prior 20 or 30 years. This particular part of the journey is going to be to autonomous vehicles. What they're doing now is they're putting all the capabilities in year over year. That they have some capabilities they put in two years ago that won't be used for another three to four years. You'll be actually able to download software to activate those components. The goal at the end of this, uh, and some people will tell you it's five to seven years away, others might tell you it's 10 or 15 years away, uh, would be to have what we call an autonomous truck, but it would still have a driver in it. The driver, however, would be free from managing the truck, essentially. The, the truck would be driving itself. 
with cameras and safety techniques and various other components they put into it, they're capable of doing it today. I mean, they're running them out now. True Simple is one of the companies out in uh, Arizona that's already run thousands of miles with them with, with no driver. They still put someone in the truck for safety purposes. And that's what I think will be the next shift. How long it will be, it's hard to tell. In our next segment, Sarah Jensen with OEM Off Highway and I chat about the prospects of reshoring of vehicle and equipment manufacturing and what it could mean for both the manufacturing sector and construction. Sarah, until recently, U.S. manufacturers in all industry segments, including construction equipment and vehicles, had become increasingly dependent on um, materials and components that were produced outside of the U.S. because of the ability to, to be more cost-effective in their operations. How has this impacted uh, their ability to continue production during the COVID-19 pandemic? And now, as there's more and more of them are starting to ramp up production again. During the pandemic, it really kind of shined a light on the fragility of supply chains for many manufacturers. If they weren't already diversifying their international and domestic supply chains, they were realizing they probably need to do so now just because there were disruptions for many. A lot of it depended on where they were located. Located in the U.S. and you had a U.S. supplier, for the most part, it sounded like it was okay because most of those businesses were considered essential. Peter Anderson, Vice President of Global Supply Chain and Manufacturing at Cummins, stated in a recent interview on ABC's Nightline that over 80% of the company's suppliers at some point closed down and they were still struggling with many of their suppliers as they have started to reopen and begin ramping up production more. In April, AEM surveyed presidents, CEOs, and owners of leading equipment manufacturers, and that survey found that Seven out of 10 had experienced moderately negative impact on their supply chain. And then a quarter of them said that it was very negative, the impact. So it's kind of been a mix, but a good portion of people found they had a negative impact from it. So during the pandemic, there's this has obviously led to some growing discussion about the, the topic of reshoring or bringing back at least some of the production of materials and components to the U.S. Can you talk about what you've been hearing on this topic? So uh, we've been hearing lately some of the webinars and virtual conferences I've been attending and some of the news items we started receiving that some people are starting to consider reshoring and bringing their manufacturing back to the U.S. or maybe increasing the amount that they have here and in addition to what they have in overseas operations. There was a recent Boston Herald article that said, no, mentioned that it would be you know, beneficial to the economy. And then there was a survey from a data analysis company, Thomas, that said since March, 64% of manufacturers that were asked about it in a recent survey said that they were considering reshoring and whereas it had been 10% before that. So it seems to be top of mind for people now. Absolutely. And I, I could definitely see where reshoring could have benefits for the market segment that I cover, which is the construction mm -hmm. industry. Certainly, if there's more manufacturing coming back into the U.S. market, you're going to see more construction of manufacturing facilities. There also could be the potential for increases in warehousing because we need to see more capacity to be able to store materials, to store inventory that's being produced to then ship it on over to the manufacturing sector. In general, what might reshoring, in your view, mean to the manufacturing sector? And you mentioned the economy. How is that going to, to impact the overall economy in what you're hearing and, and based on your own 
feelings on this? It would help with creating jobs. And then there's more opportunities for jobs here. And then people have income and can spend. As you said, it would help the construction sector with having to either build new manufacturing or refurbishing facilities. There's also benefits for the manufacturers themselves. Their shipping costs could be reduced because if they're getting supplies from overseas and now getting them from a closer supplier, obviously those shipping costs are going to be lower. It would help with their sustainability efforts. There's not as much emissions being produced by having long travel times plus closer proximity of suppliers. You know, they can get stuff faster, serve their customers faster if they have quicker supply chain or access to certain products. So if there are benefits, but there, obviously there's challenges as well. Yeah, and that's, that's actually the next thing I'd like to talk about. I mean, obviously, it sounds good to bring back manufacturing into the U.S. So it's certainly, you know, job creation, the ability to have those supplies produced here in, in this country. That all sounds very good, but... Obviously, there are challenges that go along with that. And I think probably the biggest one and the one that we're focusing on in in this particular episode is labor availability and costs. Can you talk a little bit about that from your perspective? Prior to the pandemic, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics reported the average hourly wage for Chinese manufacturing workers was less than a tenth that of their average U.S. counterparts. As of June 2017, a manufacturing worker in Mexico earned roughly $2.30 in U.S. dollars per hour, whereas the average salary for a factory worker in the U.S. is about $15 per hour, and many in the agriculture cultural and construction markets make substantially more due to the higher skill level required. So that is a factor that would need to be taken into consideration for many. I know some of the reports and news that we've been hearing is, you know, maybe some investments from the government could help with that. Then there's also the training, which again, I mean, in many of the industries, both our publications cover it's training of skilled labor has been an issue and getting people to enter these industries. So that would be a challenge and an opportunity again for the government to maybe help with some incentives or, you know, people coming and working together with universities and companies and everybody trying to work on that. Yeah, I think that that you bring up a really good point. I mean, the issues that existed prior to the pandemic haven't necessarily changed in terms of some of the challenges with the workforce for both the manufacturing and the construction center. If you look at things along the lines of just the, the skill sets needed to be able to, to employ these people productively. One of the statistics that I, I saw from the Associated General Contractors of America, a survey that they released back in January, showed 81% of construction firms responding were having a hard time filling salary and hourly craft positions, yet they were reporting they were going to be needing to expand their headcount in 2020. Obviously, this was prior to the pandemic. They they also reported that 44% of them were indicating that the staffing issues were going to be driving their costs higher, which goes back to that whole concern. Anurban Basu, uh, he's the chief economist with Marcom Construction Group. He's also risk of people leaving the industry he issued um, recently was following the Great Recession, the U.S. Department of Labor found that roughly 60 percent of displaced construction workers found employment in another industry. Preventing this from happening again is crucial for construction during the potential recovery. This is an issue that isn't just impacting the construction market. It's also impacting manufacturing. It's baby boomers. In addition to people leaving the industry sector during difficult times, we're also seeing the baby boomers leaving the workforce at this time. How that's being affected by COVID-19 is yet to be determined, but according to Pew Research, Over a third of the workforce, or around 41 million workers, come from the baby boomer generation, individuals born from 1946 to 1964. And it's been estimated that from the time period of 2011 to 2019, roughly 10,000 baby boomers were going to be reaching retirement age 
every single day. Retirements continue to have a major impact on the construction industry. Roughly 41% of the current construction workforce, according to the National Center for Construction and Education and Research, including people in key management roles, are going to be retiring by the end of 2031. And let's face it, the dynamics of attracting people into the workforce haven't changed. It certainly throws out the potential that we are going to experience, you know, it seems kind of ridiculous to be talking about workforce shortages at this point, given the number of people that are unemployed in the U.S. right now. The dynamics of the industry, the fundamentals haven't changed. Construction has had challenges in filling workforce roles in the past. And certainly, if we start to see reshoring happening, start to see demand for more manufacturing jobs, that's going to impact the industry I cover definitely because Mm -hmm. we're going to be competing for that many more vacant spaces out there in terms of, of, of filling those jobs going forward. It also affects costs. I mean, certainly it's going to affect costs for manufacturing, I would suppose, and it's certainly going to affect labor costs for the construction marketplace. There is a lot of high unemployment, but many of these people necessarily weren't from these industries. And to get them to enter manufacturing or construction or related industries has always been a challenge and will likely continue to be a challenge. And then training a lot of these people with this skills that are necessary will continue to be a challenge. And again, it's, you know, having the cooperation between universities and one article mentioned, you know, possibly having government incentives again to help with on the job training to maybe make it easier. I know AEM, the Association of Equipment Manufacturers, has been petitioning the U.S. government to have a more of a national strategy for manufacturing to help with these kinds of things and help support manufacturing and make it more appealing to people to do business in the U.S. and help with the job creations and possibly the investments needed to increase any maybe technology or, you know, building facilities, whatever is needed to help increase it here in the U.S. again. Right. And you bring up the issue of technology. Manufacturing has been increasingly turning to automation to fill some of the workforce shortages that have been seen, but also to to boost productivity, obviously. That's a trend that we're starting to see more and more in the construction industry, as well as construction firms turn to things like increased mechanization, bringing in equipment in place of physical Mm -hmm. labor, or bringing in technology that can enhance the productivity of less skilled workers, technology like grade control and and other things that can help enhance the skill sets of the labor force that's currently in place and coming into the market. Do you see that continuing for, for your industry as well? Again, there's also been investments in that over the years. Costs have been somewhat prohibited and for companies, but global data and analytics company recently put out a report where it believes the COVID-19 pandemic may actually give some sort of incentive to accelerate automation within manufacturing facilities. Because things are automated, you're maybe less reliant on having people there physically doing some of the work. And it can help increase the productivity and overcome some of the supply chain issues that occurred during this time. Then there's the uh, International Federation of Robotics, which also recently reported that, you know, while some have said implementation of robotics and automation in factories might take away jobs, it actually benefits them by automating some tasks and augmenting other tasks. And you still need people running or monitoring those machines and it'll create different types of jobs and again might require you know some different training it's not necessarily going to eliminate jobs so it seems that there could be an increase in those types of investments going forward right right and i i think that that is one thing that we frequently hear or see comments on about 
oh, well, automation and robotics and all of these different technologies that are being implemented, not only manufacturing, but we're also seeing more ex exploration of things like automated functions and automated machines, remote control, other types of technology out there that people are, are looking at and saying, well, that's going to take away jobs. Well, not necessarily when you're looking at the labor shortages that are already out there, the, the lack of skilled operators, the, the challenge in getting people trained. This gives a new opportunity to not only get the production you need from a, a smaller workforce that isn't being replenished quickly, but also drives productivity up and allows for new jobs that have greater skill sets. Plus, it allows those that are in the workforce to do more important, less menial tasks that have to do otherwise. So I think there's definitely the opportunity. I know that we are also going to be going further into the topic of advances in technology in the transportation and manufacturing and construction sector coming up in a future episode. We won't go too much further into that at this point. Sarah, is there anything else you'd like to share? Oh, no, that's all. I think that I think we've covered it. <laughs> all right. Well, great. Well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah, for joining me in this discussion. In our final segment, Equipment Today's Kurt Benning shares what he's uncovered about changes to hours of service regulations and what it means for both drivers and their employers. Hi, this is Kurt Benick, Senior Editor for Equipment Today. In this segment of the transportation chain, we will be discussing the recent changes to the hours of service regulations issued by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. There are four significant changes. First, the new rule expands the short haul exemption to 150 air miles and allows a 14-hour work shift to take place as part of the exemption. Second, it expands the driving window during adverse driving conditions by up to an additional two hours. Third, it requires a 30-minute break after eight hours of driving time instead of on-duty time and allows an on-duty non-driving period to qualify as the required break. And fourth, it modifies the sleeper berth exemption to allow a driver to meet the 10-hour minimum off-duty requirement by spending at least seven rather than eight hours of that period in the berth and a minimum of off-duty period of at least two hours spent inside or outside of the berth, provided the two periods total at least 10 hours, and that neither qualifying period counts against the 14-hour driving window. The new rule would not increase driving time and would continue to prevent commercial motor vehicle operators from driving more than eight consecutive hours with at least a 30-minute change in in-duty status. New updates to the federal hours of service rule will speed up construction of the transportation improvement projects while maintaining road safety. To learn more, we talked to Nick Goldstein, Vice President of Regulatory and Legal Issues for the American Road and Transportation Builders Association. Hi, this is Kurt Benick. I'm a senior editor with Equipment Today magazine, and we're here with Nick Goldstein, Vice President of Regulatory and Legal Issues of the American Road and Transport Builders Association. Nick, I understand in terms of hours of service, there's been some major changes in the hours of service rule or some major updates. Can you tell us a little bit about the updates? Uh, sure, there, there have been. The Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration recently promulgated an update to the hours of service rules. This is something that ARTBA, the American Road and Transportation Builders Association, we had been advocating for increased flexibilities to the rules for some time now. The reason being that, you know, the hours of service rules were designed for long haul truckers. They've been kind of applied to, as I'm sure a lot of folks listening to this know, they've been applied to 
all trucks, including transportation, construction vehicles, which which aren't driven on a long haul basis, but you know are driven for shorter amounts of time per day, and in fact, you know, oftentimes you know are powered on but remain idle on a construction site. So you know their hours of service clock would be still going. So yes, the new rule, which was, I believe it was officially printed in the Federal Register on on June first. And it'll it'll go into effect here in, in a couple of months. It makes four changes. One is to increase what's called the the short haul exemption, which is the exemption from the rule for vehicles that do not travel you know great distances. As I was talking, and it increases that from 100 to 150 air miles. The second change is that it allows so drivers under the rule ha- have to take mandatory 30 minute rest breaks. It allows those drivers that are on break to still participate in non-driving activities. So you can be on a break and you can be, you know, checking your paperwork or things like that. And that still counts towards the 30 minute mandatory rest break. Third, it increases the flexibility that drivers have when driving in adverse weather conditions. So I I believe what it does is it, it, it tacks on two hours there for adverse weather conditions that I'm not as familiar with. And the fourth change, which I'm also not as familiar with, just because it does not impact ARTBA members as much as it may other segments of the regulated community that are affected by the rule, but it does increase flexibility for use of sleeper berths to satisfy, you know, breaks under the rule or or, or stopping your vehicle under the rule and, and using your sleeper berth in your truck. Okay. And for construction contractors, is the biggest benefit going to be the air mile radius rule? Yeah, both the air mile radius uh, and the allowance of non-driving activities to, to, to satisfy the rest break. Because, you know, oftentimes, as I said, you know, what will happen is we'll have a piece of equipment that's on but not moving on a construction site, but it has to be kept on because they're loading, they're unloading, or, you know, it's, 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 it's storing a material that equipment will still be on so the driver can still get timed out for hours of service. So this way, you know, there's a little more flexibility there where a driver can be participating in some sort of non-driving activity while they're on that break. So that's also of importance to us as well. Are there benefits from the air mile, increasing the air mile radius rule because you don't have the restrictions that you have? I understand when you're operating under a short haul exemption, if you didn't have that exemption. Yeah, I think, you know, that just increases, you know, the ability because again, you know, workers may have to travel between job sites and such, and this gives them more flexibility to do that by increasing that air mile radius, you know, by a third uh, or, or by, by half from 100 to 150, you're upping that by, you know, 50 additional air miles, which, which is quite significant. So that allows them more flexibility to go between job sites during the day and to do what they have to do without having to, you know, become impacted by the hours of service rule. Now, there's one thing I I should mention there. We did ask for a change. So the agency had asked when they originally proposed the changes whether or not in order to qualify for that short haul exemption, the driver would have to return to their original workplace. We had said no. Uh, We didn't think that should be the case. And and that's the case right now. So they were asking if they should remove that requirement. We had said they should remove the requirement because we didn't feel like there was anything that makes the original starting point more or less safe than whatever starting point the driver ends their day at. Now, they chose not to do that. So that requirement does still remain in place. We still approve the changes that they made. But in order to to take advantage of the short haul exemption, as with before, the driver must still report back to their original starting location. In terms of the the break, does that solve a lot of other issues? When I talked to some people who ran service trucks or technicians trucks, that was a real sticking issue there where you had to have somebody on standby in case somebody timed out. Is it, does that help solve that issue? I believe that it does because the drivers can do more while they're on their break. They can, again, participate in those non-driving activities while they're on their break. And, you know, I should point out, too, that, you know, one of the reasons that we advocated for these changes is, you know, again, with transportation construction, our members are often asked to do complicated jobs in a very short period of time. 
There's a reason they don't want this construction going on during rush hours and stuff. So they give you small windows of time to do it. So any increase in the hours of service rules help that. In terms of additional changes, was there anything else that your members brought up about it? I imagine that most of your members are really happy about the hours of service changes. Have you had any feedback at this point? We think this is a very positive development. It's an acknowledgement of what we've been telling the agencies for some time now, which is basically that transportation construction workers are not long haul drivers. These rules were not meant for transportation construction. And, you know, we've seen that as well in you go onto a job site now and there are all sorts of pieces of equipment that are exempt from the rules. And for good reason, you know, I think the, you know, some asphalt equipment is, is exempt from the rules. Some ready mix concrete equipment is exempt from the rules because they're not the type of equipment that's driven for long periods of time that you need in hours of service rule for. Uh, and, and so we think that these changes are just another step in, in, in that direction in recognizing what we've been telling the agency is that the transportation construction community is not who, who these rules were, were meant for. You happy with all exemptions? Are there still, still areas that you guys are looking at for improvements? We're very happy with what FMCSA did. There's always room for improvement. I think the ideal it would be a, a uniform exemption for transportation construction, and, and we will keep pushing towards that end. But that's not to say that what has happened here is very positive. It recognizes that we need increased flexibility in order to operate in a safe manner. Again, when I was talking to you about types of jobs that transportation construction workers are asked to do in very short amounts of time, you know, over the span of 24 to 48 hours, oftentimes the hours of service rule detracts from the overall safety of that effort by forcing us to time out drivers when they haven't driven over a long period of time. You know, we're forced to time out and change workers, forcing them to take more time in a work zone for a job where that time is a precious commodity and and they need to get in and out as fast as possible for safety reasons having to do with both the workers and the motoring public. Now, is there anything unique about the current environment that this really comes along at a good time to help out with the contractors at at this particular time or... The changes that we're talking about have been in the works for years. So they predated the pandemic. But that said, I mean, we have seen since March when eight federal agencies started reacting to the pandemic, FMCSA has the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration has provided hours of service waivers for truckers that are carrying materials necessary for recovery efforts or for for hospitals, you know, that sort of thing. I believe, you know, they've extended hours of service waiver. I think they're on their second or third emergency extension for, you know, overall waivers to help make sure things are getting where they need to go to help recovery. Uh, I'm trying to remember, when when was the last change in hours of service? When when the current regulations that we're modifying now, how long have they been in place? That's a good question. It's been some time. I honestly don't know how long it's been, and it wasn't on this grand of a scale, I don't think. I think this is one of the biggest sort of changes to the rule we've seen in some time. I seem to remember in the early 2000s, there were a couple of changes made to the rule, but I don't think they were as big a changes as what's just happened. How did you settle on 150 miles versus 100 miles? How did they settle on that number? I mean, was it an arbitrary number? Do, Do most contractors, are most contractors work within that 150 mile radius? Well, no, I don't think it was arbitrary. I think that the agency reached out. You know, this has been a multi-year effort on their part. They've conducted listening sessions, public comment sessions. So, you know, based on the feedback that they got from the regulated community, and there were thousands of comments, I believe, submitted to the docket, a number of different listening sessions that they did around the country. So with the data that they received from those sources, you know, they came up with 150 air miles. And, you know, that's something that, you know, our, our members at least have been happy with that. Is there anything else you'd like to add about the changes to the hour of service and how it impacts your association? Just that, uh, you know, overall, we think it's a very positive development. And we think it recognizes that transportation construction is different from long haul trucking and that it allows flexibility that our members need to, you know, continue to improve transportation in this country while still maintaining, you know, necessary safety standards.
Thank you, Kurt. That's it for this episode of Transportation Chain. Thank you for watching and be sure to tune in for our next episode as we take an even deeper look into the challenges and opportunities ahead for transportation, trucking, and supply chain management. Until next time.